Catholic exorcists explain the top five ways you might become possessed. Number one, the occult. What is the occult? According to Father Vincent Lampert, the word occult comes from a Latin term meaning hidden or secret and focuses on knowledge of the paranormal and is usually associated with well-known occult practices such as palm readings, mediums, Ouija boards, and pretty much anything meant to see into the future or talk to evil spirits. It's associated with things like palm reading, mediums, playing with a Ouija board, tarot cards, going to see a psychic or a medium, the practice of yoga, Reiki, the use of crystals, the use of magic. All magic is inherently evil. And I don't mean illusion, such as a card trick, but magic in the true sense of the word is inherently evil. There can be things like reading your horoscope. Again, things may seem like they're entertaining and fun, but that doesn't mean that the devil isn't using that in a very subtle way, just trying to get a foothold into our lives. Father Lampert also explained that when you consult psychics or mediums, you are either consulting a fraud or someone who is likely possessed or in constant communication with demons. Now, you might be wondering how someone could get mixed up in the occult, as it seems pretty easy to stay away from. But in reality, we are spiritual beings, and we seek relationship with the spiritual world. This is unavoidable. So, in our time of great spiritual crisis and faith, and with so many people fallen away from the church, people go looking in different places. This is because of the vice of curiosity. You are no doubt familiar with the expression, curiosity killed the cat. Well, Curiosity might also kill your soul. Father Dan Rehill explained as much to Michael Knowles. But curiosity is not a virtue. Hmm. And if you start digging into the occult and, and the dark world and things like that, you're opening a door. And you might not be strong enough to close it. And then you've invited something into your life that you don't want. And then you have to call me. Personally, I think one of the reasons so many people go looking for occult things in our day is because the new mass is so mundane and banal, and it is void of any real mysterious or spiritual experience. Everybody rejoice, rejoice, risen from the dead and he is Lord. So if you want to keep your kids away from the occult, find a traditional Catholic mass. The second way that demons enter into our lives is through our screens. Children today, well, everyone basically, are in front of screens all the time. I know I spend hours and hours each day looking at my computer and my phone, most of the time for work, but also for personal life things. Our devices are perhaps the easiest way for demonic entertainment to get into our lives. I think we can all imagine the ways that demonic things come through our screens if we're not careful. But it isn't just the content that is the key to demonic influence in our lives, but the isolation that comes with it is also extremely important. Father Lampert explains. For most of us are just looking at our own device. So we're missing out on the sense of community. Jesus came and gave us the church. The church is a word that means community. The devil's goal would be to isolate us, where we just become a collection of individuals trapped in our own little worlds, living by those three guiding principles. You may do whatever you wish. Nobody has the right to command you, and you're the God of yourself. Essentially, if the devil can get us to turn into ourselves, then we are easier to prey upon. 
Of course, people have always had alone time, but not like today. Because alone time for most in our day is not spent with a book or listening to classical music in a quiet room, but instead scrolling through content that is often very immoral. Even exorcists don't like to be isolated or work alone, as Father Rehill explains. I don't work alone. Hmm. I mean, that would be horribly imprudent to go into a situation when you're dealing with demons or the devil himself uh, alone. So contrary to popular opinion in the movies we see about exorcisms, we never go alone at midnight during a thunderstorm <laughs> to a strange person's house in the woods to do an exorcism, hmm. you know, sort of like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, this is not the usual setting of, okay, got it. So I have a team. I always have other people with me. Often it's another priest. Uh, so we're all seeing the same thing. The third way that demons gain control of our lives is through curses. A curse is the opposite of a blessing. A blessing is when something or someone is commended to God. A curse is when something or someone is commended to the devil or evil spirits. In fact, well-known exorcist Father Chad Ripperger said that curses can even cause physical health problems. And when I left, I got the worst case of gout I ever had in my entire life. I mean, it was... <laughs> and. Um, I, I was actually the priest um, that one of the priests that had trained me had sent her to me to help because he couldn't do it. And so I, um, a week later, this gout wasn't going away. Usually if I just cut out dairy, boom, it'd be gone. And I didn't really have it that bad to begin with. But then this was a really bad case. A week later, nothing's happening. I even took those pills that are supposed to get the uh, uric acid out of your body and all that. Nothing happened. So I realized, I wonder if she cursed me. And so I did that exorcism of Leo XIII over myself, and within an hour it was gone. Wow. So that tells you. And so I called the exorcist that had sent it to me, didn't hear from him for two weeks, and I started getting worried about it. He calls back and says, oh, you know, I would have called you, but I had the worst case of gout I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, you are cursed. And Because I asked him, do you still have it? He says, yeah, I still have it. I said, is it in your right toe? Is it in the big toe in your right foot? And he says, yeah. I said, that's where mine was. So he did the he wow. did the minor exorcism. Within an hour, it was gone. So she so, cursed both of you priests. She did, yeah. Now, this doesn't mean that catching curses is like catching spiritual cooties. Exorcists deal with the deepest and darkest evil in the world. So for them, it might be an occupational hazard. But Father Lampert explains that if you are strong in faith, you shouldn't worry. Curses are only effective if you're weak in your faith. We cannot control what another person does. They may wish us evil. They may be engaged in occult practices, trying to pass on curses and whatnot. We can't control them, but we can make sure that we're spiritually strong. You can think of Ephesians, putting on the armor of Christ. We think of Psalm 91, I need not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. And why? Because we're protecting ourselves with God's grace. So again, curses are only effective if we're weak in our faith. If we believe we've been cursed, then the solution is for us to grow in our relationship with Christ. The fourth way that demons gain control in our lives is through habitual sin. If we are constantly living in a state of mortal sin, then we are essentially without any divine protection. When someone commits a mortal sin, they are cut off from the divine life. And when they confess their mortal sins and do penance, they are again in friendship with Jesus Christ. Think of it this way. If you are constantly in a state of sin, then you are constantly in a state of spiritual sickness, which means it will be easier for you to become spiritually diseased. And one of the worst diseases would be to be infested with demons. Father Rehill calls sin a weapon leveraged against you by demons. So we always go to confession before we go into a deliverance because mm. you never want them to, not that we're sinning you know, right. in these great ways, but you want no weapon leveraged against you. Like as human beings, we're spiritual persons incarnate in a body, right? And that's, a, that's one person together. So what affects the spirit is going to affect the body. What affects the body affects the spirit. And when we amass sins, particularly if they're grave sins, um, over a long period of time in particular, there are demons that hook into us and they harass us and they follow each other in packs. And so often it's like a snowball going down a hill. I just did this and then I did that and then I went to this sin and then all of a sudden here I am and I'm 
in a bad place. That's what they're doing. They're, they're pushing you to keep going further into your sinfulness. And when the priest absolves the, the person in the confessional, um, not only is their soul wiped clean, but the demons are broken off the person. And so when you feel that levity, that lightness of leaving the confessional, so many people say to me, I feel like a weight's off my back. Yeah, because you've been set free. It's not just the sin. It's the demons attached to the sin. This is why frequent confession is so important. The fifth way that demons enter into our lives is something that's likely going to hit home with many of my viewers, and this is through broken families. Broken families are an epidemic in our world, and it isn't hard to understand that the demonic would be on the rise as a result. If we think back to the idea of being isolated as a way of making you easier to prey upon, then it is easy to understand how a broken family would play into this. Kids from broken homes are often isolated and learn to not trust authority figures such as their parents who they feel betrayed by. An unhealthy rejection of authority in principle is not good, as all authority is from God. But what is maybe even more important is that broken families often lead to bitterness and resentment, which is terrible for the spiritual life. Father Lampert explains. So broken relationships. The best example is found in Scripture itself. Chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel, the story of the Gerasene demoniac. So there's a man possessed by legion, living in the tombs. Shackles won't even hold him, superhuman strength. And what did the demons say? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus commands the demons to be silent. They ask to go into the swine. How many swine were there? Does anyone remember or heard of? 2,000. So how many demons was this man possessed by? They asked to go into the herd of 2,000. They race over the hillside and they drown in the lake. Most people stop reading the story, but what happens next is very profound. The man who's now free of legion wants to follow Jesus, but Jesus says to him, no. How often does Jesus tell someone not to follow him? He says, no, go home to your family. A man that was living amongst the dead, Jesus wants to put back amongst the living. And in the world of exorcism, it was the brokenness within the family that eventually brought about the demonic possession. So again, we all deal with brokenness, but rather than giving in to bitterness and hatred and anger and revenge and all that ugliness, we should always seek forgiveness. Doesn't mean that it will be easy, doesn't mean that it will be instantaneous, but that's the path that we should always put ourselves on. Ultimately, if we want to keep Satan out of our lives, then the best thing we can do is go to Mass, go to confession, and pray the rosary every day.